Take your Bibles, if you would, Mark chapter 14, verses 32 through 42. We're going to look at this briefly this morning, um, and let's read the entire text as we jump in. Mark chapter 14, verses 32 through 42. If you are new to Emmanuel, we've been going through the book of Mark now for almost an entire year. We're coming up to our close, just a few more weeks, um, but this is where we pick up Mark chapter 14, verse 32. They went to a place called Gethsemane, and Jesus said to his disciples, sit here while I pray. He took Peter, James, and John along with him, and he began to be deeply distressed and troubled. My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death, he said to them. Stay here and keep watch. Going a little farther, he fell to the ground and prayed that if possible, the hour might pass from him. Abba. Father, he said, everything is possible for you. Take this cup from me, yet not what I will, but what you will. Then he returned to his disciples and found them sleeping. Simon, he said to Peter, are you asleep? Could you not keep watch for one hour? Watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the body is weak. Once more, he went away and prayed the same thing. When he came back, he again found them sleeping because their eyes were heavy. They did not know what to say to him. Returning the third time, he said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting enough? The hour has come. Look, the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us go. Here comes my betrayer. Think about this time of distress in Jesus' life. Everybody here knows what it is to experience some kind of distress. It comes from time to time, and there are different levels of of distress, but all of us know what it is to face some kind of situation that feels overwhelming like this. It's different than stress. Stress is actually a good thing. Distress can be crippling. The stress of lifting weights, for example, that's a good thing. You lift, your muscles feel the resistance, there's stress in that, but you get stronger. But then too much weight, or for doing that for too long, that becomes distress, and it can be harmful to your body. The the dictionary defines distress as a great pain, anxiety, or sorrow, acute physical or mental suffering, affliction, Trouble, a state of extreme misfortune. So distress is like stress on steroids. It's when things begin to cave in, and it leaves you stunned and even despairing of life. Like, I'm not even sure how I'm going to get through this. Let me give you some examples of this just recently. In my life or in people that have communicated some distress to me, And these are different levels um, because it's not all just completely overwhelming, I'm going to give up, but there are different levels of distress. For example, yesterday our serve students were were here and we were serving and we all finished and we all came back together to celebrate over lunch and there was one project that did not get done. So there was one group that we needed to go back out and, uh, and go into the afternoon and you could just see it in their faces. Stress says... I've worked all morning. Distress says, ah, I don't want to work anymore. What group is that? Were there some people that were right here that were doing that? That's distress. It's like, ah, I'm, I'm just, I'm done. And there's this, you could see it in their eyes. It's like, I want to go home. I want to take a nap. I want to be done with this project. But then they had this incredible experience as they went out. They shared about what a wonderful thing that was. The difference between stress and distress. Recently, uh, or, or last week, stress is not calculating the time needed to make your airport shuttle and then rushing to catch that shuttle. That's stress. Distress is getting close to the place where you catch the shuttle and watching it exit as it leaves to the airport and you're not on it. That was me this past week. That's distressing. Recently, I had a friend with a conver- uh, conversation with a friend who um, talked about how 
how a friend of his experienced there was stress at work, obviously, difficulties, deadlines, responsibilities, but distress is when things are being done in that workplace that are unethical. And he feels like God is saying, I want you to leave your workplace, and I want you to trust me on the other side of that. And that's exactly what he did. He walked away. I mean, stress of work, distress of I'm supposed to walk away from my weekly income. Stress is going to the hospital. Distress is when there's uncertainty whether you're going to leave the hospital, which is the case of a family in our church right now. Stress and distress, where are you today? Mark makes it clear that Jesus has moved from stress to a place of distress. Look at the words again here in verse 33 and 34. Mark says he's deeply, Jesus is deeply distressed. He was troubled. He had a soul. That word soul in the Greek is psyche. It's your mind. It's your heart. It's the representation of your whole life. His soul was overwhelmed with sorrow. And then grief There was grief to the point of death. Luke says in this same account, when Jesus is praying in the garden, he says that Jesus was in such agony of spirit that his sweat fell to the ground like great drops of blood. Have you ever been there? I think you have. I've been there many times. Some kind of news that you don't want or some kind of hardship or trial that you're facing. It's another something that you're dealing with, and it's just like it, it takes you to your knees. That's this place where Jesus is. It's a, a time of distress. It's all throughout the Bible. The Apostle Paul talks about this. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 8 and 9. He said, when you, We think you ought to know, dear brothers and sisters, about the trouble we went through in the province of Asia. We were crushed and overwhelmed beyond our ability to endure. And we thought we would never live through it. In fact, we expected to die. But as a result, we stopped relying on ourselves and learned to rely on God who raises the dead. Beyond our ability to endure, God gives us or allows us to go through things that we can't handle so that we turn to him. That's a place of distress. I read this past Friday in my Psalms reading, Psalm 88, verses 3 through 7. Look at this scripture with me. My life is full of troubles. Death draws near. I'm as good as dead. Like a strong man with no strength left, they have left me among the dead, and I lie like a corpse in a grave. I'm forgotten, cut off from your care. Like, God, where are you? You have thrown me into the lowest pit, into the darkest depths. Your anger weighs me down with wave after wave. You have engulfed me. This is what Jesus is experiencing here. He's feeling this. He's alone. He's overwhelmed. He's facing the cross. And it's not just the pain of the cross. It's the pain of losing this fellowship with God because he's taking upon the sin of the world. And it brings great distress into his heart. This was a cup of suffering that would lead to God's judgment on his life on behalf of you and me. So the reality of distress, we all get there. And if you're not there today, then you will be at some point, or you'll know somebody that's going through it. So let's just think for a moment about the danger of distress. Verse 38, it says, Jesus said, Watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. So while distress can lead you to complete, it can lead you to complete reliance on God like it did for Paul. It can drive you to your knees and draw you to God. It can also drive you away from God. And it can lead to your downfall as you become especially vulnerable to temptation. So this is huge. This is really a big deal that when you face a distressing time in your life, will it draw you closer to God or will it be something in your life where you run away and you don't experience God and it only gets worse? That's what happened for Peter and these disciples. Peter is the classic example of this. Three different times Jesus approaches him and says, watch and pray. Watch and pray so that you don't fall into temptation. 
Times are going to be really hard. This is distressing right now what I'm going through. And Peter could resonate with that. He left his job, his fishing business. He's following this guy named Jesus, and he's doing whatever Jesus says. And now all of a sudden, Jesus is saying, I'm going to the cross. I'm getting ready to die. It's a distressing time in his life. And three times Jesus says, watch and pray so you don't fall into temptation. And three different times, Peter falls asleep. He's not watching and pray, praying. And what do we see as a result of this? He did fall into temptation because he didn't watch and pray. And how many times did Jesus, or uh, how many times did Peter deny Jesus? This can't be coincidence. Three times Jesus says pray. Three times uh, Peter falls asleep. Three times Peter denies Christ. Watch, pray, stay close. That's the way we get victory on our knees. It's so cool because that's not the end of the story for Peter, obviously. If you've read the Bible through, then you know that Jesus meets with Peter on the Sea of Galilee after his resurrection, and he restores him. And he says, Peter, feed my sheep, take care of my church, Lead my church. Three different times, Peter, feed my sheep. Three times. Three warnings, pray so that you don't fall. Three times asleep, three denials, and now three restorations. The key to avoiding a fall is staying alert, watching, and praying. We win when we're on our knees and in total reliance on God. Look at this uh, quote by Piper. He says, when something drops into your life that seems to threaten your future, remember this. The first shock waves of the bomb in your heart, like the ones Jesus felt in Gethsemane, are not sin. The real danger is yielding to them, giving in, putting up no spiritual fight. And the root of that sinful surrender is unbelief. So how do you fight distress? What is it in our lives when distress comes? It's real. I'm struggling. I'm feeling overwhelmed. How do you fight through that? That's the big question here. And the first way that Jesus shows us here is that relationship is the key. To bring close friends along and then open up to them and be honest with them and ask them to pray. Look at verses 33 and 34. He took Peter, James, and John. This is his inner circle. He took them along with him. That's a huge phrase. He took them along with him. And he began to, uh, to be deeply distressed and troubled. My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. He said to them. He said to them. It wasn't just that he was praying to God and that was enough. He told them, share this burden with me. Like, this is real. I need you in my life. This last uh, week, I just was beginning to feel overwhelmed with just um, responsibilities and things that are going on, just like you do in in your life. But uh, I had been sick for probably close to two weeks, and I just was not feeling well at all, feeling sluggish day after day after day. And um, and I had this uh, head cold, and then it was hard to communicate, and I was coughing through the night, and I was getting three, maybe four hours of sleep, and I just was exhausted, and it was midweek last week, and I had a meeting early, early in the morning at 6 a.m. Everybody left but one guy, and I just shared. And I brought him along with me, and I just said, man, I'm feeling overwhelmed. I've got this going on, and there was all this going on this week, and with the construction stuff, there was uh, a trip that I was planning. It was just a real quick trip on Wednesday night and driving all day Thursday to come back, and I had a sermon still to prepare And uh, we had serve day coming up, and I felt super responsible about all of these neighbors that need projects, and I just felt overwhelmed by all of it. And I just shared, and I brought him along, and I opened up, and he said, can I pray for you? Do you bring people along? Or are you like, no, I got this, I'm going to give this one to God. It's, that's life. This is Christianity. This is what we do. 
I could give example after example of people in this room that you've helped me, you support me, and hopefully we find that among one another. Numbers eleven seventeen. Moses was overwhelmed. He was trying to do it all by himself. And he got word from God and said, I will come down and take some of the power of the Spirit that's on you, Moses, and I'm going to put it on them to help you. And look what it says. They will share the burden of the people with you. They're going to share the burden. Galatians 6, 2, share each other's burdens and in this way obey the law of Christ. So relationship is the key. Distress, I'm moving into depression. I got to get some people in my life that can that I can talk to. Here's the second thing that we see that Jesus did. Intimacy and honesty with God is key. Jesus addresses God as what? What does he say? Abba, Father. Abba, the, the way a Jewish child, child addresses his father in a sincere, childlike way. And then he's honest with God. Look at verses 35 and 36. Jesus fell to the ground and prayed that if possible, the hour might pass from him. That's the honesty. Like, God, I don't want this. Let this hour of suffering pass. That's honest. Verse 36, the Abba, Father, there's the intimacy. And then he says, everything is possible for you. Take this cup from me. Take it away. That's honesty. That's being real. I hope you're doing that with flourish. Have you noticed as you go through Psalms, the honesty of the, the psalm writers? Like, God, where are you? It's been so long. I mean, it's just raw. It's real. Do you journal that way? Do you pray to God that way? If you looked at my journal, if you looked at my flourish journal, you would see, Brad, what, I mean, it's just emptying the soul before God. It's intimate with God, and it's honest with God. Here's the third thing that Jesus does, is he throws himself onto the sovereignty of God. The sovereignty of God. Look at verse 36, the last part of that. He says, yet, yet, not what I will, but what you will. And so he says, God, I don't want this. But more than that, I'm going to trust in the sovereignty of God that if this is what you have for me, and that this is the only way, I'm going to trust the sovereign hand of God. The word sovereign, we use it a lot in Christian circles. Here's the meaning. It's someone who has supreme and ultimate authority and power. So circumstances don't dictate your life. People don't dictate your life. You don't even dictate your life. The sovereignty of God. He is the supreme, ultimate authority over your life. And there is, that's either a comforting thing or a really scary thing. Because if your sovereign authority in this world is evil or is unkind or is unjust, that's a scary thing. But when your sovereign authority is somebody who is so for you that they would give up their life for you. Now that's a beautiful thing. Jesus is our sovereign Authority as king who gave himself up. That's pure love. So you throw yourself on the sovereignty of God, much like Isaac did with his father. They were going up to Mount Moriah for the sacrifice. Abraham brings his son along. He is to sacrifice his son. And Isaac is carrying his own wood for the sacrifice. And he says to his dad, hey, we're going up to the sacrifice. We've got the wood but where is the sacrifice? Where is the animal? And what does Abraham say? His father says, God will provide. God will provide. And the next phrase is, as they continued walking, like Isaac says, oh, my dad who loves me passionately promised he'll take care of it. He will provide. That's the way we live our life. We throw ourselves on the sovereignty of God. My God has got me. And the last thing we see here with Jesus and how he fights through this time that could lead to depression or despair, is he focuses on the end goal. If we could jump to Hebrews 12, verse 2, it says, For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. And so you say, okay, this world is not my home. Worst case scenario, I don't get through this. It doesn't go away. 
but God has got a plan through it, and it's going to be a beautiful thing. And so for the joy set before me, knowing that I'm obeying God, that he's working all things together for good, I will move forward according to his plan. And then Jesus gets new strength, and we close. Look at verse 41 and 42. There's brand new strength for him. He says in verse 41, returning the third time, he said to them, are you still sleeping and resting? Enough, the hour has come. Look, the Son of Man is betrayed into into the hands of sinners. Rise. And what does he say? Let's go. Come on. Let us go. Here comes my betrayer. And because he went in this fashion with other people, intimate with God, trusting in the sovereignty of God, doing it joyfully for God, the betrayer comes and he says, I'm ready. Let's do it. Let's face it. New strength in time of distress. Let's pray together. Would you bow with me for a moment and let's just give our distress and our pain and our hardship that maybe nobody else knows about. Let's give that to God. Maybe you're here today and this morning and you're thinking, Lord, I, I feel lost. I don't know where you are. I'm experiencing a pain that I don't know what to do with. I'm lonely. I'm frightened. Would you today... Make a commitment to share honestly with a friend? Would you go before the Lord now intimately and honestly? Maybe you need to throw yourself on the sovereignty of God and just say, God, I trust you. And maybe you need to ask God, Lord, I want joy again. And my joy comes through obedience. And so I'm going to take the next step, believing that in the end, you have the best in store for me. Lord, thank you for your presence that it never goes away. And thank you that you're always at work in our lives. If you're here today and you've never thrown yourself on the sovereignty of God, knowing that you have a sovereign king who has died for you and he rose again to prove his sovereignty, if you've never thrown yourself onto this king and you've never bowed before him to say, oh, What a God you are. I give my life to you. Would you do that right now? In your heart, in your psyche, in your soul, would you say, Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. But I believe. And I throw myself onto your sovereignty. And I say, not my will, but your will be done in my life. And that is the prayer of a new beginning. That's the prayer of salvation. Give him your life. He's trustworthy. In Jesus' name, amen.